Okay, so this is Brendan Kidwell. He's, he's uh, very graciously um, offered his time and effort to present uh, uh, something on passwords for us. So uh, let's show him the appropriate, appropriate pre appreciation. So, uh, a couple of things before I begin. Oh, you want to start that? No, 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 go ahead. Uh, a couple of things before I begin. Um, this presentation is copyright uh, myself, of course. Uh, it's licensed under a Creative Commons license, specifically uh, Attribution Non Commercial Share Alike Version 4.0 International, and abbreviated CC by NCSA. Uh, long story short, that just means if you have a copy of this, please share it. <laughs> um, so, and I am going to put this on YouTube. I, I've been promising to put talks on YouTube for a couple of months. Uh, I created an account. I'm going to start uploading them this week. This one should be up by next Wednesday or so, and I'll start doing the back catalog. I've got about six or seven, I think, from uh, from this forum. Um, so, uh, at, we had a disclaimer earlier about. Um, uh, caveat mTOR, but I need to underscore that and say that it applies now. Um, I don't have a lot of formal training in information security and cryptography. I know what I'm talking about. I, I do this for work, but I may make mistakes. Um, you can't rely solely on me to, and come crying to me if, if you take advice from me and something goes bad. Uh, take it under advisement and uh, you know just be careful. And of course, I can't be there to look over your shoulder when you do it. But um, believe me, this is good advice in the talk that we're going to be going over. So, um, do you think you know what a bad password looks like? Like, what's a good password, what's a bad password? Um, think about that question for a moment. Let me show you this video that I found on, uh, it was in my social media feed actually last night. I was just, you know, checking in, browsing the feeds, and the caption was, uh, I don't know if it was a poster or not, I, I don't know where it came from, but the caption said, this is a politician that was, uh, looks like he was on a news program or something, he was about to be interviewed. And uh, let's take a look at how he enters his password and he logs into his computer. Thank you. Yeah, do you think you can tell me what that password is? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, right. I think he's six characters and it's probably one, two, three, four, five. Well, that's space balls. So, this guy obviously doesn't have any, any idea of what a good password looks like. Uh, don't be that guy, please. Um, but before we talk about um, what's a good and a bad password, let's do a little bit of a, an exercise here. Somebody close the window, or I, I can close it. Um, the camera's microphone is right in front of the window. Careful of the tripod. Thanks. Okay, so why do we care about passwords being good or bad? Um, the reason we care about them is because somebody could compromise your password or otherwise compromise your login on some online service or your device you have at home. Um, you've got login protections and lock protections in all kinds of places. Uh, and you need to have good passwords where there are passwords because uh, somebody, there's always somebody. Uh, anonymous threats that don't even know who you are, there's people you know, uh, all kinds of actors out there and bad software trying to break into your stuff. So uh, can anybody just shout out any threats they can think of, like what would, pass related to passwords, what would compromise my account online or compromise a device password? My first wife. Your first wife? <laughs> Let's put that down. Okay, any more? Date of birth? No, it, what would, what's the threat? Uh, so, like, what 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 is the thing that could act against your security situation and break your security? The government. Government. Okay. Definitely. What else we got? Using your password on an unprotected network. Unprotected network. 
password on the screen. <laughs> password displayed on the screen. Dog's name. No, that's a type of password. That's not a threat. Uh, Russian hackers, Chinese hackers, Iranian hackers. Foreign yeah. yeah. hackers. Corrupt data. Corrupt data. Corrupt data. Corrupt data. Okay, so I, I have a few written down. Uh, let's see, we have... Um, key loggers? Key logger? Yep, key logger's good. I had... Um, How about introduce virus? Virus? We'll put viruses and key loggers together. Uh, so, guessing. So, uh, that, that kind of goes with... Oh, <clears throat> well, actually... My wife has all kinds of physical access. Let's keep my wife separate. Guessing is another thing. So people that know you might be just guess. guessing what you chose for passwords based on things that they know about you. So there's guessing. There's uh, stealing the online database. And I had uh, bad programming in service. Using default manufacturer's password. Default passwords. <laughs> Okay. Uh, compromised email is a good one. And the reason I wrote down compromised email is your email is like the key to everything. If, if you're securing an online account, pretty much 98% chance you are required to give them an email address. And if they can contact you by email, they will go ahead and reset your password for you. No more questions asked. And so if you think about that from the other way around, if somebody compromises my email, they can break into everything that they know that I, everything they know where I have an account. Um, because they can just go and say, I want to reset my password via email. And if they've compromised my email, they can get that reset ticket. What were you saying? Social engineering. Social engineering. Same with phishing. Sorry? Phishing. Phishing, yeah. Phishing. Okay. And that's those social engineering and phishing go together because often phishing is trying to get you to reveal your email password so that they can get into your email database and take over everything. Yeah. Using public Wi-Fi. Public Wi-Fi. Yeah, yeah, well, that's, let's put that with unprotected network. Writing your password on a sticky note. <laughs> 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 screen and uh, social engineering phishing compromise tech support I'll put that all in one category I have written down compromise tech support there's actually been a few problems in the past with uh, people uh, with contact Amazon and say I, I'm locked out of my account and it's not the owner of the account and two or three steps later they're in the account and the account owner is nowhere to be seen. Um, there's not really much you can do about that, but you do have to be aware of it. Uh, so let's, um, let me uh, freeze, uh, let's see, freeze cells, freeze first row. Okay, uh, how likely is your wife going to, or your husband or your children going to break into your stuff? What, what do you want to put for a likelihood there? Depends on the marriage. Very. Uh, they, you don't trust the people you live with, do you? Uh, government. Um, oh, yeah, very likely. Are you sure it's very likely? Because yes. pretty much everyone in here, except maybe Hank, nobody in public knows who we are. So does well, the government care about us? 33 parents, they, thought, they didn't think that they would know, that they would get caught for 10 years. What was that? The uh, 33 parents that got caught two years ago. Oh, yeah. And, well, actually, that, that ties into what I, the argument I was just going to make. So it is really very likely. The problem with government <coughs> is they don't care about your mouth, but laws change, and they've been recording all this data. They've been just hoovering up everything they can see, but they don't care about you now. But 30 years from now, the laws are different. The political climate is different. You might be a criminal, even though... You didn't think you were a criminal, Kevin? Lack, lack of privacy on, on, on the reason why privacy <coughs> is pursued in our country and, and in other democratic countries is because they know no matter what, as long as there's an opportunity to steal data, somebody will do it. Yeah. 
sooner or later, some, whether it's legal or illegal, scrupulous or unscrupulous, somebody's going to do it. And that goes along with an important point I was going to make later in the presentation, that when you're signing up for online services, you have to assume every service that you have a relationship with is going to be compromised in the future. And it's very likely that most of them won't be seriously compromised. But you have to assume every one is going to be because it happens all the time. What do you mean by an online service? Uh, your email, your uh, Amazon, um, your bank, your health records, anywhere where you, you use a web browser over the internet to access information that belongs to you. All of that could be compromised at one time or another, and you have to assume that and work that into your strategy for being secure. And we'll get to some points about that. Kevin, you wanted to say something like, else? Things like Social Security that lost 50 million names and Social Security numbers. Yeah. Equifax. Uh, well, Equifax is, compromised everybody who is basically has spending power in the United States. Exactly. That the number of people is about equal to that figure. Nothing happened. Uh, and yeah, nobody got in trouble. Facts get charged for, one penny. Former employers might might want to break into your. Yeah, we can write former employers. Okay. Because maybe maybe they're looking for employees who've gone gone rogue. Okay. Um, so we could continue to list uh, all. Of the, I, I just I was going to make a list, but we've we've got a lot of possible threats here, and this is going to take a long time to think about likelihood and severity of each one. But the point of this exercise is to list out, when you're thinking about how am I going to do security, how am I going to be secure about something, and tonight we're talking about passwords, the first thing to do is write out all the threats that could possibly break it, and then try to think about how likely is that threat to actually occur, and how severe is it. If that threat, if, if that break actually happens, do I care? Uh, and for severity, a lot of those things comes down to what was the thing being protected. Is it my Amazon account, my health account, or a forum that has nothing to do with anything that no one cares about? And um, so after you do that threat analysis, that leads to the conclusion that I have that I want to um, that, that work from is that there's two big rules that I'm going to have, that, that I have for passwords that I'm telling you. Uh, in all of your passwords everywhere, on every device, on every online service, every password should be random, and it should be unique. Those are the two rules, unique and random. And by random, I mean uh, it can't be guessable. Like, if your password is short enough, or if there's enough computing power, um, you know, if your password is really, really long, like it takes you several seconds to enter it, and it really is random, no one's going to break that. But there's other avenues to attack, and. We can talk about that later. But a not random password is something like, uh, let's say uh, I have a cat named Fluffy, and uh, I picked her up from the shelter uh, in March of last year. So remember I said, uh, we, we said that had that threat before about uh, people that you know, your wife, your children. Uh, how many people know that I have uh, fluffy and that I picked her up in March of last year. Right. Now, that's one fact of ma among many about me, but if there's a determined attacker who is really after my stuff, then a not random password like this, and this is not random, uh, is just completely useless because they're going to try everything they know about you until they find it. And if they have stolen the database that contains your password, they might not be able to read the password, but they have to try far fewer guesses before they get the right answer. Does that all make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. So passwords have to be random. And in order to generate random passwords, you can use a program that can just string words or characters together for you. And we'll get to that in a little bit. And the other major rule that I was talking about is unique. Every password must be unique. If you learn nothing else tonight, learn that every password must be unique. If I have the same password on my email service, as I have on that random forum where I talk about sailing. What happens when that forum that's built by somebody that doesn't know what they're doing gets compromised, <coughs> the passwords aren't even encrypted, and they have my email address as my login on that forum, and there's the password because they, they don't know how to program it right. They've got an email address and a password. What's the first thing to do if they, if they steal that database? They go to that email service and try to log in as that person using that password. And remember how I said a few minutes ago, 
your email is your most important thing. So people will say, make sure that the password on your email is different from the password everywhere else. But I would say just never use the same password twice. And that leads us to, in, in a little bit, we're going to get to well, actually the next uh, thing. I, I guess I'm segueing right into it. Uh, password managers. And uh, the idea is, in order to have a random, unique password for everything that you need a password for, you're going to end up with, depending on what your life is like, uh, you could have a, a dozen passwords. Or if you're like me, you have literally 500 passwords in your password database. They're all different. I don't have to remember them. The password manager software remembers it for me. And whenever I need it, I just copy and paste. So. Uh, now that I've demonstrated the need for unique random passwords, let's uh, go into a little demo of how you do that. I'm going to show you two solutions, and there are other solutions that we can talk about later. Uh, actually, I'm going to I'm going to mention a third, but then we can, you can shout out any suggestions or uh, whatever, depending on how much time we have. Yeah. We're 21 minutes in now. Um, okay, so key pass is the first thing I'm going to mention. So. Key pass, let me close all the password files I had open. Key pass is a desktop application which um, is available, it, it's desktop and phone and handheld tablet. It's available for Windows, Linux, Mac OS, and uh, Android and iOS. So basically any computer that you're going to use that has a, a, a screen of some sort, uh, Key pass is available for it. And uh, what KeePass does is it works with a file stored on that device. Uh, so if you use KeePass on more than one device, you need to come up with some way of sharing the file from one device to another. And we can talk about that in a few minutes. But KeePass creates an encrypted file on your device that you encrypt with one master password. And that's got to be a good password. And once you set up that database and it's got the encryption set up, you can just throw as much information in that database as you want and it's got tools built into it for managing passwords. So let's go ahead and create an, a database in KeePass right now. I'm going to go into my projects folder and password presentation and call this demo. So the first thing it says is you need to give me a password. And it's very important that this be impossible to guess, because if somebody finds your key, key pass file, you want to make sure that they can't just guess it and get into it. And it has to be something that you will remember. Because if you forget your password on this, and if it can't be guessed, you're out of luck. You will never decrypt this file. Uh, so be very careful about that. And I would actually recommend, once you come up with what the password is for your key pass database, first time you're doing this, you, people say don't write it down in post-it notes, but I would say go ahead and write it down on a post-it note. And if you don't trust the people that you live with, keep it in your pocket, in your wallet, whatever. Make sure that it's in a secure place. And then after you've logged into KeePass like you know two dozen times, and, and if you're doing it all the time, if you, all your passwords are in KeePass, you're going to be using it every day or every week. Once you've logged in enough times, you know, okay, I'm never going to forget this password. Then you can destroy that post-it. But if you're not sure, you really got to write it down and keep that in a secure place. But that's the one password that you, well, that, uh, that's a password you've got to remember. And the other, there's a few other passwords that you have to remember, things like your phone and logging into your computer itself because you don't have access to, that, to the KeePass database until you've unlocked the thing that contains it. Um, but beyond those, most other passwords are going to be like, you can just, Throw it into KeePass, you don't have to memorize it. You can always just copy and paste whenever you need it. And uh, there was actually, uh, oh, there was one kind of password I had in the, middle, uh, in the middle category. You've got passwords that you have to enter to unlock devices. That, those are one category, and they have attributes on them. The, the extreme end of that, the other extreme end is uh, passwords that can just be copied and pasted from KeePass. But then sometimes you've got another category of password where I've got my KeePass database over here, and then I've got a phone, and it doesn't have my KeePass database on it. I might log into a website on the phone and sometimes uh, have to look up the password on my computer and enter it into the phone. And 
uh, that's when you want to talk about password complexity. You could have a password that is a string of four or five words, and that's easy to punch in on the phone. Or it could be a 15-digit number, that's easy to punch on the phone. But if it's like 30 completely random characters, you're not going to be copying 30 random characters off the screen into your phone. So you've got to think about that when you're choosing what your password is going to be. Sorry, I'm skipping around a little bit. I didn't get a chance to make slides or a proper outline. But here we are in, in KeePass. We want to create a database. It needs a password to encrypt it. And this is a password that we can never lose. So the tool that I would recommend for creating passwords, uh, there's this web page called XKPASSWD, uh, XK Password. And that is actually inspired by an XKCD cartoon. Um, does anybody, is, who is uh, familiar with uh, XKCD? I've heard of that. That didn't work. No, I hit the wrong key. F11. There we go, full screen. So this was, uh, oh, I forget how many years ago. It was a long time ago. Um, he said that through 20 years of effort, so this was definitely a while ago. We've, succeed, we've successfully trained everyone to use passwords that are hard for humans to remember, but easy for computers to guess. Mm -hmm. And that's the point of this cartoon. So it used to be the common wisdom that you create an ugly password like this, which has you know substitute letters for uh, symbols or other or digits, and throw in some random punctuation in there, and it would be common for people to recommend passwords that look just like this, but look at how many letters that is. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Did I count that right? Um, this has, uh, where does it say? Uh, here. That has 28 bits of entropy, according to the cartoonist, who is an engineer, by the way. Um, and in this cartoon, it has this word entropy a couple of times. What entropy means in the context of this discussion, and I'm greatly oversimplifying it, is basically how complicated is this password? Um, and it's directly related to if you have a copy of an encrypted, an encrypted copy of the password, how many hours or days or years is it going to take just by random brute force guessing to come upon that password? And so if you make a password like that, it's 28 bits of entropy. If you make a password like this, that's 44 bits of entropy, and this is logarithmic. So you may say that that's like going to take twice as long. This is actually um, how many? Uh, four, ten, uh, two. Th this is actually 16 times more difficult than that one. So if this one would take three days to guess, and it wouldn't take three days anymore because this cartoon is old, but this takes um, three days to guess, it would be. Uh, actually, it would be to the power of 16, right? I don't know. Anyway. anyway, every bit of entropy you add, it's vastly more complicated. And if that one's going to take three days, this one's going to take 550 years, which is basically never going to be cracked. Um, but remember, there's always other ways you can get the administrator to reset the password. Mm -hmm. There's social engineering. Um, we're just talking about the password itself in, in this thread right here. And look how much easier this password is to remember, to type, to copy and paste. Correct, horse, battery, stable. Just four random words. Um, so that's the method that we're working with here for the passwords that have to be typed in. Uh, passwords that don't have to be typed in, just make 30 random characters. You're fine. But we're talking about the uh, key pass encryption password uh, right now. So we've got a make a password that we can remember, that we can type in. And so you go to XK, XK password. Oh, I forgot to mention. Um, you probably saw this at the beginning. Uh, Go.glump.net slash passwords. All the resources that I point to are on that page. So you can just write down that one thing. and You can write down the names of things. You'll, you'll find it there. Uh, so go to xkpassword.net and click on XKCD mode, and then that sets all these fill, uh, switches here to XKCD type, type of password. And then you can scroll down and say generate three passwords. Now, that generation that just happened, it happened on my computer off the network 
the entire Word database is in, loaded into the computer. The program runs in my browser and it just generates random words. So you don't need to worry about the service that is hosting this program. It's never going to know what passwords I generate. And I pick one of them and I can write that down. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. Um, Finland compound learn felt. Copy. I'm going to write that in my notepad here. I'm going to save this in case it crashes. Now you shouldn't save the password on your computer because if somebody breaks into your computer, they're going to find it. But for the purpose of this presentation, I'm saving it on my computer. If I was doing this at home, I would probably be writing on a post-it, just like I said, or I'd be writing it in maybe in a notepad on my phone. But you only do that if you think no one's going to break into your phone. So let's create the password. The encrypt the database with Finland. And I can actually just say show password and make sure I get this right. Compound. Um, and of course, this is case sensitive. Whatever, whatever you choose for a password, you've got to get the uppercase and lowercase right, or it's never going to work. Okay, so I set the password, and I can click OK. And then I've got to save the database to a file. Oh, we, we always did gave it a file name. I forgot that. Okay, so here's my empty password database. And let's uh, add one or two passwords, and then I can demonstrate actually using this along with the website. Um, so let's say uh, Brendan's bank account. Username, Brendan Kibbo. Password, uh, I'm going to write in 12345, but obviously that's a very bad password. That's not the password for my bank account. So um, you'll see that there's a lot more than just the username and password here. There's uh, the URL field is useful, of course. You can use that to say just write in your password database. Once you save it, you can just say go ahead and open this URL. I'll do that right now. Uh, since I entered the URL, I can say uh, open URL, and then it goes to my browser and tries to load bank.example.org. And then I get to T-Mobile suggestions because it's not a, re a registered site name. Um, but also it's got a notes field, it's got a expires field, so if you know, if, if the service provider tells you they have rules that this password is going to expire, you can write that down right here and say, I know that you know in on May 9th or whatever, I've got to go and change this password before then because it's going to expire. Uh, you can put any comments in here. We'll get back to that in a moment. Um, there's also you can attach files. So if if there's other things besides passwords you need to log in, for example, a key file or um, I guess a key file would be the most likely thing. Uh, if you're given a file that needs to be associated with this account, you can actually just attach it. Uh, wrong, wrong place. You can attach it right here and just add a file to the database. It'll be stored in the database, encrypted, and then you can delete it from wherever you had saved it before. And then it's associated with that account login information. And I said we were going to get back to um, notes. Yes. The uh, This is a pet peeve of mine. Let's say that I was actually setting up my bank account login and they said, uh, we need you to provide us with the answers to three special extra security questions. And you have a lot of questions to choose from, like uh, what is, in what city did you meet your partner? And there might be um, name of favorite pet, childhood pet. No. Remember what I was saying before about don't make anything that's guessable? You can just, most of these questions that the banks and the, and the health uh, care providers and everything, these extra questions that they give you, these are stuff that you can just, you know, be uh, a fake friend of somebody on Facebook that knows you, and you can read through the fees and just find out all this stuff. So when your bank or your employer or whoever says that you have to pick some of these extra questions and then fill in and give us the answers. Don't give them the answers. No. All you have to do is go back to the password generator 
and grab another password and then say, in what city did you meet your partner? I met my partner in tight green soil A. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ever do anything besides this yes. and always write it down because you're, if, if your account gets locked, they're going to ask you for these, these uh, words. But don't make it anything that anyone could guess or could find in public information. Always just pick one of the questions, generate a random password, add it there, and you've just got more, it's just more passwords. That's just how you should think of it. Don't lose the, the extra passwords, and don't give them anything that could ever be guessed as the word. Uh, so there, I just created one account there. Um, what did I want to do next? Um, Uh, we only need to create one, you get the basic idea. Uh, I will say that it has, uh, you can have folders, so uh, financial, I can take that uh, bank account and stick that in the financial folder. I could have another folder called social networking, and then, you know, organize, you, you get the idea. Um, what else we got? You, get, you can change the icons if you, um, if you really need to, I never do this, but if you like, you can assign icons to the groups and to the items, but, you know, if you like it, go for it. And I covered attachments. So, if you do end up using PPAS, it, again, it uses a file stored on that device where, where PPAS is running. Um, and if you want to use that same file on other devices, you need to come up with some way of sharing it. And you could either do that by copying and pasting it once and just say, I'm never going to, like, I can copy this database onto my phone, install KeyPass for the phone, and then just say, I'm never going to enter a new password on the phone. And uh, once in a while, I delete what's on the phone, copy it from the computer again, refresh it. That's one way you can sync. Uh, another, uh, another way you could sync is services like Dropbox or Google Drive or OneDrive. Now, KeyPass is designed very well so that Whenever you're editing the database, it's actually just storing a list of changes to make in memory. And then when you save it, it reads the entire file, makes the changes, writes the file back to disk. So you never have to worry about synchronization conflicts with Dropbox and Google Drive and OneDrive. Uh, if, or uh, you could also use a free tool called SyncThing. I, I recommend checking that out. Um, if you have the same file open on more than one computer, you can be adding a password here, adding a password there. Whenever you save it, that's when it actually reads the entire file, makes the change, writes it back. And then that change is going to get propagated to the other devices right away, assuming you're using that kind of a sync tool. Uh, so it does play, around, play along very nicely with um, these type of syncing things. But um, there's another route that you can go if you don't want to use a desktop application that has to be installed, has to be synced. Uh, there's all kinds of tools that you can use online running your browser instead. And LastPass is one of them. Uh, LastPass.com. And I say this and I'm telling you that LastPass exists. <coughs> I don't use it. I don't endorse it. But I wouldn't say that it's bad. They've had a couple of problems in the past. Um, I think you can trust them more than you can trust most online services. And uh, there are definitely others. You should look for reviews, see what you think, pick the one that works best for you. But I'm just using this here as a demo and uh, to show you that you can do it online. So let's say uh, get LastPass for free. I don't think it takes very long to sign up, but uh, oh, I need an email address. Um, how much time do we have? We have 20 minutes left and that includes questions. Yeah, I'm actually not going to demonstrate this because it might take too long. But it's basically, looks like this but it runs in your browser and it's synchronized with um, uh, it's synchronized with the server every time you make a change immediately and uh, you don't have to worry about installing or syncing everything and LastPass uses the same method that KeePass does in that you have to generate a master password that's used locally to encrypt the data and there's no way that LastPass can read your passwords I have to add a little asterisk to that if LastPass changes the program, and you don't know that they changed the program, for example, if the government of the United States went to LastPass and said, we require you to make this change to the program so that we can fish all the user's master passwords, 
you just have to kind of assume that that's never happened, uh, or just trust that you don't you know don't care if that happens. But assuming that the worst doesn't happen, LastPass is not capable of retrieving your data unless they had some opportunity to record what you wrote in for your master password. Uh, so it's it's secure with that little asterisk. And I would still recommend using an online service versus not using anything at all and having the same password on eight different accounts. Um, so, but it, the, the experience is basically like this, except it's running in your browser. You, you've got a list of uh, categories on the left and, and entries. The entries all have attributes. You can put them in. Oh, I forgot to mention that um, both KeePass and LastPass will generate passwords for you. Uh, I kept mentioning you might have like a 30 or 50 character completely random password. Uh, this is good for that. Um, you can just say, let's go ahead and make uh, 50 random passwords, including symbols, whatever. Just generate and uh, I guess say apply. And you know, anywhere that you're not going to be typing it or remembering it, that's a perfectly good password. It's never going to be brute forced. It's, it would take the before the heat death of the universe before they figured it out. <laughs> um, so you can generate completely random, just random string of letters in here. If you want to make something that's easy to read and say, you should uh, give uh, XK, XK password uh, is the best way to do that. Um, LastPass might have a word password generator. I'm not sure. It's been a while since I've tried it. Um, so that's LastPass. Oh, uh, if you don't want to use KeePass or LastPass, you have another option. Let's say that you either do trust everyone you live with, and or you have a safe or you have a, um, a you always carry it. This is a perfectly good password database. And it, my mom, my mother does a variation of it. She has index cards that buys them that they already have a hole in them, and then she has a, a little ring that goes through the hole. So that whenever she adds a password to her pile of index cards, she just has to take the ring off put it in an alphabetical order and put the ring back on. And my mother only lives with my father and my sister, and there's, you know, they all just share everything, and there's just no concern about people snooping in each other's stuff. However, if somebody broke into my parents' house, all of her passwords would be compromised, but also she'd have bigger things to deal with. So that works for her, just, you know, write it, write it down on paper. But never, never, never use a password notebook on paper at work, where a bunch of people that you don't trust are all using the same room. Don't even think about that. You get in trouble at work probably if you do that. Uh, so that's all the different password database options. Uh, don't uh, don't discount the simple and stupid option. Do we have time to talk about two-factor authentication? Okay. Um, do we want to do questions or do we want to talk about two-factor authentication? Let's do a, a two-factor. Okay. So have you heard of two-factor authentication? Have you heard of TOTP? Um, yeah. The biggest brand name you probably have heard is Google Authenticator. And uh, let me pull, I think I can find that in Wikipedia. So two-factor authentication is the concept that uh, when people are identified in a security context, uh, there's this idea that instead of just having something you know, what if you also have something that you have or something that you are? Something that you have is a physical thing that cannot be copied. So it's like I have the one instance of this thing that identifies me and because I have it I know that no one's stolen it from me and it can't be copied. That's a thing that you have, second factor. The other second factor could be a biometric, something that you are where a camera could scan your iris, or uh, you could use a fingerprint scanner. Um, and there's all kinds of research and arguments about how effective biometric measurements are for authentication. Um, I'm not really an expert in it, so I'm not going to comment on it. Um, but the something that you have is something that everyone can use. Uh, and it's integrated in a lot of services, like your, your bank probably has it, your, financial, your, your health institutions probably have it. Google email has uh, something that you have authentication. Um, anywhere where the service provider is really concerned that your account doesn't get compromised, like basically not a forum about sailing, uh, it's very common to have second factor authentication in the form of something you have. Now, 
Um, something you have is supposed to be something that can't be copied. And there are caveats to implementing that on a phone, like waving my phone around. Uh, in the past, we used to do the something you have as a physical token that was like a little tiny computer that had a little display on it. And if you try to open it up, it would basically fall apart and destroy itself. And those were the, uh, the first version of this. And the reason those kind of got phased out and you don't see them very often, you may have a, a key fob for eBay, if you, or you may have seen someone use an eBay key fob. That was fairly common a while ago. Um, unfortunately, they cost somewhere in the order of 5 or $10, and the people that are handing these out don't want to pay for all of them. So we made a software version of it. And through various protections in uh, Android operating system and iOS operating system, you can put together an application that makes it really hard for someone to copy the database of that application out into another device. Um, it's not foolproof. If you compromise the security of the device, you can easily just copy whatever that state was. But you, you just have, kind of have to assume that the device is secure and that, it, that nothing else on the device is going to copy the configuration information to be the something you have token. So it's an, it's a mostly uncopyable software application that acts as a token. And I, I didn't actually describe what it looks like. Uh, let me. Do I have um, Smile? Uh, what's the name of the cheese? Oh, I probably didn't install it. But there was a thing to uh, open the camera. But I'll pull it up on my phone. Um, and if you squint, you can see it. So this is my, um, it, it's not Google Authenticator, but it's, a, it's an alternative to Google Authenticator. They, they use the same protocol. Um, so the reason I can just go ahead and show this to you, even though it's got numbers on the screen, is that these numbers are no good the next minute. Once a minute goes by, that number's no good. You can't use it for anything. The way that this works is when I initialize, I've actually got uh, three accounts in here, my uh, DreamHost hosting account, uh, WordPress.com, and my email service. When you set up a device that, um, with pairing your Google Authenticator or whatever you have with a remote service, they... Um, I'm just going to describe it because we've only got a few minutes left. They give you a number. It's usually a really long number. And they'll often display it in the form of a QR code, which is, um, I'll show you what one looks like. So they'll show you a QR code, and you can just scan it with your phone, and that will get the, the, the random number into the phone. Once you have that random number loaded into the phone, that acts as a seed for a pseudo-random number generator. And uh, long story short, that basically means that a magical formula is running on the Google Authenticator token that takes that seed and says, for any given minute in the future, um, with reference to, to the time that that seed was created, you can come up with what is the correct number to display in the token at, at that particular point in time. And the formula is designed in such a way that if you try to go the other way and say, I know that, that at this particular minute the right number was 3894471, I can't get back to the seed. And because I can't get back to the seed that we use, I can never um, guess any future number you must know the actual seed, which is only copied from the service provider into the token and then never seen again. Only the, the token reads it and takes your number, but you can't copy it out of there, and it's never going to display it. Um, so that's kind of an overview of how you uh, set up uh, Google Authenticator. You, you go to the service and say, I want to set up two-factor authentication, and then they're going to say, you can use blah, 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 or Google Authenticator. You say, I want to use Google Authenticator. And then they say, OK either write down this number or take a picture of this QR code and use that to configure your Google Authenticator token. And then that's in there. And then usually what happens after that is every time you log into that service where your session has expired or maybe every single time you encounter the service, it depends on what kind of security they want, they're going to say, I want to know your password and I want to know the current number on your Google Authenticator token. And that ends up being, again, something you know, your password, and something you have, the Google Authenticator. And usually, they're, they're also going to want to set up some kind of a backup, like in case you lose your Google Authenticator. 
And the best way to do that, it's not the way they always do it, is the best way is they'll give you a really long string that's just a random key, and you've got to copy that down, put it in your password database, and you can use that to unlock your account in the event that you lose your phone. But always make sure that whatever the emergency unlock per, uh, system on that account is, make sure that you configure it correctly and know what's going to happen. If I lose my phone, am I going to be able to unlock all these things, or am I never going to get into the account again? Make sure that you have it set up right. Um, so that's basically all the material that I had. And we have at least 10 minutes for questions, and I think we want to do a giveaway after that. Right. Uh, let me pull up my uh, resources. So you can write down these names, or you can just go to go.glunk.net slash passwords. And uh, these are all hyperlinks right here, uh, whatever works for you. Question. Yeah, I once went to a workshop. Someone recommended something called the Yubi key. Have you uh, used that yourself? Yeah, that's the that's the real like that's a newer, updated version of the the really simple uh, eBay key fog login thing. Uh, that is a something you have, and that is really not copyable. Okay. It, it's a computer with memory design in such a way that if you ever try to tamper with it, it's just going to fall apart and break. So you can load a key into it, but you can never get the key back out. And it'll always keep on generating those new numbers every minute for you. And you can have many accounts stored in it. YubiKey is great. I've never had one, but it's really good. I recommend it. Okay. Yep. Yeah, question. Would you recommend any of the uh, browsers that are maybe just using the browser itself as a password manager? Any good browsers out there? Um, Chrome or, or Firefox? Uh, browser extensions have issues with security. Um, and actually, LastPass has a browser extension that allows you to easily um, paste your uh, password into forms to log in. But you have to be careful with browser extensions because, and, and I don't know all the details of this, but it's possible for a program that's running in the page to access the data that belongs to the extension, and the extension knows your password. Uh, so I would, I would just steer clear of that. And if you use LastPass, I would really recommend just log into LastPass in one tab, find the password you want, copy to the clipboard, paste it into the other tab, and you'll be much safer. Question? Every time they say, um, you know, don't just think of letters, think of numbers and symbols. Um, they ask you to decide. Yeah, but um, this is a good password here because it's really long. And it's not as good as the, it's not nearly as good as the 50 random letters, that 50 random everything that I had before. But this is good and long. If you have just four or five, six words strung, strung together, uh, it tells you on the bottom, they, they, they give the entropy value of these passwords as somewhere between 121 and 224 bits. And uh, if they know how you generated the password, it's only 81 bits of entropy. So this is pretty good complexity right here. And as long as it's enough words, you don't need to have random symbols and stuff. Unfortunately, when you're creating a password on a service, sometimes they'll say that password isn't complex enough because there's no digits and there's no symbols. So you're just going to have to go ahead and add um, you know, a couple of symbols there and make that your password. Um, but again, anytime that you're not going to be writing the password into a login form manually, you can just go ahead and use that, um, you know, just generate random garbage. Uh, in the back first, and then... Uh, yeah, is, it, is there a good password for our computer club, our Wi-Fi? Uh, is that a good password? Yeah, well, consider, what's the threat model? What, what's the worst that could happen if everyone knows it? Um, but your home Wi-Fi, I would really recommend uh, your home Wi-Fi be... Use the XKCD password generator, because you're going to be entering this every single device. But use, use this method and use six words. Uh, or use as many as will fit. I think it's like 64 characters or 63. Fill that up because uh, Wi-Fi, the encryption in Wi-Fi is actually bad. And uh, if your network is running in compatibility mode for uh, older devices or possibly newer, I don't know how bad it is today, but it's always been bad. Uh, if your password is not complex enough, somebody could just by just by listening to the encrypted radio traffic, they could break into your network in just a few minutes. And the only, the, the best you can do is have the longest possible password on your Wi-Fi. But make it something that you can enter in, because you're going to hate it if it's just random letters. Go ahead, uh, uh, what, one thing that I One thing that I uh, think it's good to remind is 
think of, not think of it as past word, but past phrase. Yeah. And also, if you if you uh, do it in more than one language, that might be a, an advantage as well. Yes, but it must be random. If it's not random, somebody will find a way to guess it if they're attacking you personally. Always remember, it's got to be random, and every password has got to be different from every other password you have. Unique and random. A friend who has uh, a spreadsheet of uh, 50 passwords was keeping it on his laptop. Mm -hmm. He said, that's no good. He typed it on a USB drive. Yeah. And he printed it out. He used the printed version. Mm -hmm. So put it on a, a drive not connected to your computer. Yeah, and the other thing I would add to that, as long as it's an electronic file, make sure it's encrypted. And uh, I know that Microsoft Excel has encryption built into it. You can say, save this with a password. And I'm fairly certain, correct me if I'm wrong, LibreOffice Calc also has encryption built into it. Um, I don't know who is next. Kevin wanted to say something with somebody in front of him. Okay, Kevin. Two things, just as a practical point. Your wireless... Uh, if you bother yourself to put in a long encryption uh, key, um, you better take some time to find out how to, and actually do, remove the service mode, because it's a four-digit code, and there are lists out there. Mm -hmm. I, can get, I can give you a list in a minute. You mean the, uh, the administrator password yes. on your yeah. Wi-Fi record? Right? The service code. Yeah. I can just, almost, every, almost every one of those uh, routers out there has a service code built into it by the yep. manufacturer, and it's on a list. Yeah, and a list it, it was either you or somebody else mentioned in the beginning of this talk default passwords. Um, never allow a default password to exist. Either change the password, disable that method of entry, or if you can't do that, return the equipment and say this is no good. <laughs> you, you cannot have a default password in any way. And when you're configuring your Wi-Fi router, find out if there's a default password and change it if you can. Um, who's next? Yep. You prefer the key passes, the one that you use rather than uh, what's your other master pass? Uh, I, I highlighted last pass as an online service. Right. I prefer key pass because I use, uh, I said this in, in passing and I didn't, um, I didn't, didn't actually write this down in my list here, but sync thing, S Y N C thing. Uh, that's an open source tool for synchronizing peer-to-peer -peer synchronization from one computer to another. As long as two of your computers are online, they can synchronize with each other, and you don't have to think about it. So I use SyncThing for a lot of stuff, and one of those things is my password database. And that's why I use KeyPass, because it's based on a file, not based on a web service. Okay. SyncThing, S-Y-N-C, Thing. I'll pull that up. And that's a free software, you said? Yeah, SyncThing is free. And there are non-free solutions like Dropbox and Google Drive and OneDrive. Uh, they're all good. And Dropbox and Google Drive are free to use, but you have to pay if you have lots of storage. Or I, I don't know what the rules are. I stay away from them. I like to use free software. Uh, sync, this is how you spell same thing. Uh, we've only got about one minute left, and then I think we want to do the What is the drone about? Sorry? Uh, yeah. Oh, Cryptad. Uh, that was a that, that was actually a tangent that was in my notes that I didn't get to. Um, I was going to show uh, setting up an account. Uh, Cryptcat.fr. Just load up the homepage for you. This is uh, it's like Google Docs uh, and it's like Office 365, um, except that it's um, it's like LastPass. It's zero knowledge. So if I create a Cryptcat account and uh, create documents in here, uh, notepads, rich text, that kind of stuff. Uh, whenever I save it, it's encrypted in the browser and uploaded to the service. And that way the service can never read the data that I uploaded to them. Um, and I believe it's free for everyone. Yeah, I, I, it's open source software. You can install this on your own server. Um, the ser Cryptpad service, the, the cloud thing that we're looking at right here, is free for anyone to use, I believe. Uh, with some kind of uh, quota, you, you can't store too much data. That's um, in French. Okay. It's got up on it. Yeah, yeah it, it's hosted in French. My right. last little thing before everybody uh, goes down and gets their, goes to some password service, 
Um, one of the things that, that all the large providers, when they give their little talks on security for uh, system managers and so forth, one of the things they spoke about was internal hardness. Uh, that I don't know if everybody knows this or not, but on every one of the important systems, all of the NT systems, uh, there is an option somewhere in your uh, file setup for files to be encrypted. Yes. Anywhere on your machine. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and as long as you can remember what password you use, I highly recommend you turn that on. Yeah. And there's another little feature that when you, uh, if you look into your uh, the, the details of your formatter, there's an option to format to, to format encrypted. Yeah. If something really is a target, <coughs> you want to format it in an encrypted format. Yeah. Uh, those things are available. They're part of your operating system. They're free. Yeah, and if you can if you can set up encryption on the entire device, then you can be rest assured. Like this laptop is encrypted. If I leave this laptop on the train, it only cost me a couple hundred dollars. I'm out two hundred dollars. That's all. But if my laptop was not encrypted and I lost it, left it on the train, oh gosh, what did I store on that? What, did did I have a copy of that help that uh, health note or, or uh, a summary of my financial information? What did I leave on there? But if it's encrypted, it's just, well, I lost the computer, too bad. No one's ever going to decrypt it because uh, it, I, I have a good password and it can't be guessed. Yeah. Yep. Can you encrypt it after it's unencrypted? Yes. Uh, most operating system tools that let you encrypt the device, the entire device, they'll let you set up the encryption after you've already put data on it. And it'll just go through every sector in the device and encrypt it. Yep. Last thing is that one good way to keep your uh, accounts in on a fob uh, and to keep uh, encrypted because the fob itself can be a lot of people don't know that but a, a stick a memory stick or a card can have its own onboard encryption mm -hmm. okay and some of them offer offer that but they uh, they don't make it that obvious to the user how to do that yeah so you should look a bit good suggestion. Um, last question, and then we've got to wrap up because uh, people have to go home. Go well, you were just saying that if you lost your computer, but it was encrypted, it would just be your computer. So everything that you had in encrypted would be on the browser. Uh, no, I, the, so the computer itself, it. all the storage in the computer is encrypted. Yes. So, and of course, I didn't lose anything that was stored in the computer because I used sync then. So you sync, yep. synced it to something else. And then that's synced to my phone and synced to my other computer okay. at home. Um, okay, so that's about it, and thanks for your time, everyone.